Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about the greatest things that Jesus said. That's right. We're going to look at the sayings of Jesus from the New Testament, and we're going to list the ones that we think are the greatest sayings and the ones that have made the greatest impact on the world. Time to open up the Gospels and realize how powerful the Word made flesh truly is. Jesus said a lot of really awesome things, so I don't know how we're going to. I know, and then you know, like, it is package this up in an hour. But you know, I opened up this beautiful Divine Mercy Catholic Bible. I highly recommend it, and there's all beautiful sections in here, kind of sharing from Faustina and a lot of the saints uh, sharing about mercy. But don't you love Bibles that have red font? font? When it's actually Jesus Red speaking. Red letter Bibles are, I, I think they're them. essential. I don't think every, I think every Bible should be like that because you are then immediately clued in Jesus is talking. Yes. About. Instead yeah. of quotation marks, which would immediately clue you in too, <laughs> you guys need a little bit of extra help. That's what you're saying. We do. I mean, if this, it's a traditional way though. I still remember my grandmother with her Bible open and Jesus's words in red. Yep. And for a while, there just were a lot of Bibles that were published that didn't do that. Yeah. And with quotation marks, English was my least favorite class in school. <laughs> um, why, why red? Do why red? Why Anyways, right? we'll, we'll save this for another episode. Because they jump episode. up, man. <laughs> We're saving this for another episode. So Jesus, obviously, is the Word made flesh, and His words bring life. And, you know, it's, it's challenging because every word that He has expressed, the ones that have been cataloged in the Gospels, and the ones that have struck the hearts of the apostles and those that He spoke to, have, you know, passed down from generation to generation— and, you know, like John said in the gospel, you know, if, if everything that Jesus said was cataloged, there wouldn't be enough, you know, books to be able to carry what he expressed uh, in the incarnation. So, you know, jumping into this right off the bat, we're going to be sharing some of the ones that are outstanding to us. Yeah. But in the comments section below, we want you to be sharing as well the things that stand out for you in the gospels that Jesus said that that you really live your life by. Yeah. And I think it would be fair for us to admit that saying you know, the episode of this, the title of this episode, The Ten Greatest Sayings of Jesus. Honestly, we were just trying to get you to click on it. So now we're going to share <laughs> 10 sayings of Jesus because everything he said is the greatest. Uh -huh. And there's no way that we can equivocally say these are the greatest sayings. So these are 10 that we identified that have a, a really profound meaning, a really great uh, history of kind of creating a maxim within the language. And they become things that are so ingrained that we sometimes can forget that they were said by Jesus first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and it was really neat. Like when I opened up the gospels for this, for this episode, I immediately came to this line from Jesus and read, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. We do find rest in his word. And, uh, I'd like to start that this, this episode off with that word. Awesome. So the first one that we picked here, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it is so reassuring. It is so just beautiful, and I think it's serene. And a lot of times this world can be very difficult, right? It can be very hard to navigate you know, all the, all the things that we struggle with. And a lot of people have anxiety. A lot of people have uh, worries that are almost insurmountable. And this is uh, coming from the Gospel of Matthew, um, chapter 6, verse 34, but there's more context to it. But therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. Mm. You know, in, in other translations, this also stands out for me um, because, you know, sufficient for day is, is the evil therein of that day. And... and you know, to not allow your heart to be consumed with anxiety. <clears throat> I'm curious to find out what the Dewey Rames uh, Here's the Dewey Rames. Expresses. Be therefore not solicitous for tomorrow, for the morrow will be solicited for itself. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Which is, which is more of a literal translation, as we know, the Dewey <clears throat> Rames is a literal translation of the Latin Vulgate. And that, for me, really always speaks to me because 
I can't I can't look to the evil of tomorrow. I should not look to the evil of yesterday. I need to be present to today and I don't want to be anxious about it. Mm-hmm. There is going to be evil that I have to confront, but let me confront it uh, not anxious, but with a responsibility in Christ to meet it with peace. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the present moment has its enough, right? Mm-hmm. It's, there's enough evil in the present moment. And I you know, I I see a lot of people, um, friends and and others that uh the anxiety that they have is is, you know, the digging up their past and it might be personal evils, you know, it might be their own like dirt, uh, you know, and and the concern that they have about that and then looking to the future and they, they lose the present. The presence, it's a present, literally. You open it up. It's a gift. It's a gift, baby. You know, you got to have it. Why are you laughing at me? Because <laughs> you're like the Joe Dirt of Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> like, life's a garden, baby, dig it. <laughs> uh, I was genuinely, I was genuinely listening to you. And then I started drifting a little bit. And I started looking at your t-shirt. And you're wearing a Golden Girls t-shirt. And it says squat on it. I um I That's can't beautiful. right now, dude. And I just stopped and I started laughing. And then your voice was just you're being so serious. I'm sorry. So, you know, I, I do like I, I will go back to the full context of this particular quote. Um, oh. And this is, again, this is from Matthew 6. And Don't worry. We're doing the, um, so, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than the food and body more than the clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's troubles is enough for today. The, in, in Chesterton's Everlasting Man, he gives a beautiful breakdown of this reading and about how it is indicative of the most masterful teacher. And even in the character of how this is given, it shows that he is more than a philosopher, more than a founder of a religion, that he is uniquely God-made man. The authority, the peace, and how he keeps on... It's a cyclical nature. Like, look at the, you're worried, but look at the grass. But the grass is nothing. But look at how good the grass is. And it's just this masterful teaching. But I think the underlying message of peace and beauty of nature, and it's it's so consoling. I love this verse. <clears throat> what I like about this, too, and how appropriate, Jesus' word is transcendent. It transcends every generation, but how this word is proclaimed in our own generation. Look at the social epidemic of anxiety Mm. and depression and suicidal ideation and the outbirth of, you know, the disastrous end of, of a social media interaction where my life is purely run through this medium of, of media and, and, you know, um, internet communications, you know, the, the end of all of that is just like isolation, you know, where we're made to be together. And, you know, this really consoles the heart of people that struggle with anxiety and opens their eyes to, you know, what Christ has before them. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about like my five-year-old daughter, you know, and how our father loves us, right? Like my daughter, you know, might, you know, she might not be able to find her ballet shoe or, you know, something like that. And then her, you can just watch her whole world just sort of collapse, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And as a father, you're looking at her and you're just like, 
You're going to console her. Mm. You're going to tell her that it's going to be okay. You're going to take care of her as a father. That's what our father in heaven does. He takes care of us. Mm -hmm. Right. And we may think that everything is going to crap, you know, but the reality is, is that you've got this father that's watching your back. He's going to take care of you, Mm. you know? Yeah. And we appreciate you watching us right now and always looking out for our back by punching the subscribe button giving us a thumbs up, clicking the bell, and making sure that you don't miss any content on the Catholic Talk Show. If you're listening in on all the podcasting forums right now and you're on your commute to work and you're listening in on iTunes or Spotify or Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, or any of those, you need to watch this one on YouTube because you don't want to miss this beautiful shirt that Ryan Delacrosse has on. It's Golden Girls. It's Golden Girls, and it is a golden shirt. (laughs) And uh, we want to give a big shout out to our patrons before we go any further, thanking them for their financial support, making sure that this show continues so that we can cover Jesus' sayings and how it impacts us culturally and share the beautiful history of our you, faith. You had to say pod bean, didn't you? Yeah. I did. I love Dilla Cross is definitely the Betty White of, of our Golden <laughs> Girls. <laughs> <laughs> I also have one with the... Uh, Howard's certainly the Rue McCann. <laughs> <laughs> I got one right here with Mama. I uh, suppose I'm Blanche, maybe? No, you're and Estelle. Yeah, you're Estelle you're Getty. Blanche. Yeah, I'm well, Blanche. That, that makes me B. Arthur, which is by far... <laughs> B. Arthur is the uh, premier Golden Girl. I think that's <laughs> unquestionable, right? <laughs> that's so messed up, dude. <laughs> God. Uh, that's Let's go on to the next one. All right. Now, this one is coming from the from Mark 8. And this is just, again, you know, all of these quotes to show the wisdom. Like, and mm. like you said, Father Rich, the logos made flesh. Yes. The actual the word yes. incarnate. And you can really perceive that by the words that he said. You know, in his can ministry. We, can we not read the Dewey Rames, please? And it pierces oh, through. Let's is... go RSV. That's what this. Well, that's yeah, what this is. I, I don't. I don't. So like yeah, let's shift to RSV, and then maybe we'll we'll look at mm-hmm. literal translations throughout. Mm-hmm. RSV you guys is are, my RSV is my favorite. RSV is fine. You Everybody's guys are... so excited about this passage, and we're just gonna have to wait. <laughs> so this is Mark eight thirty six, yeah. and as this is updating, because it's currently on. There, there we go. go. Um, this is from the NAB, so the New American Bible. This is the scriptures that we hear at Mass yeah. in the Catholic Church. I cho- Look, I chose the Dewey Rames. I don't want to hear about it for the rest of the episode, so we're going to go to the NABRE. Okay. Hey, <laughs> mo- tomorrow it's going to be okay. Tomorrow? <laughs> well, I'm worried about no, it's it now. Tomorrow. It's to, tomorrow. To tomorrow. the morrow. It is morrow. Okay. Mark eight thirty six. What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Again, the precision of Jesus' words cutting through the ambitions of the heart in our human flesh to give us a sense of what are we pursuing here, giving us a, a, a step back, look at this objectively, where, where is my work, my labors, and everything that I'm pursuing, where is it directed to, mm-hmm. what end is it? And you know, to be able to accomplish that in one line that I could, I could live, I could live off of this each and every day. In well, the I sermon. mean, doesn't this this verse really just sum up so much of Jesus's teaching? You know, and, and Ryan, I'm just kidding though. But I did go back to the Dewey Rames because I thought this, suffer the loss of his soul. Yeah, for what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? And it shows you that in your nature and how God created you, your indelible nature and your soul is worth more the entire, than the entire world, than all the gold, all the kingdoms, and all the acclaim. Your soul is worth more than that. So doesn't that tell you how much your father loves you, that your soul, no matter what you think of yourself, is worth more than the whole world? Mm-hmm. And that's the care of the Father. Mm-hmm. But then in the other hand, it also tells you how to store up your treasures. It also tells you how to live your life. There's so many different strains right. of teaching you can get from just one sentence. Mm-hmm. It's true. Very profound. It is. It is. And again, living living in Jesus' word and living by his word, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, when it comes to truth and, and the way in which we ought to live our life fully, you know, living by these by these sayings of Jesus, this is why it needs to be integrated so deeply in our consciousness, mm-hmm. that, that it becomes the fabric of our the way that we discern the anxieties of the present day and work those anxieties out with peace. That's right. 
So let's go to another one. And this is, you know, now I think this is one of the most famous sayings in, in the Bible, right? It, of all the sayings of Jesus, this is one of the ones that I think just about everyone knows, but I think it's worth discussing because you can always gain a lot more from rereading it and discussing it. So take you want to read one, this one? Yeah, take this one, Delacross. <clears throat> when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Mm-hmm. You know, summing up the whole law. Now, I, I think that, again, that shows the intentionality of Jesus showing that he is the second person of the Trinity, that he can sum up the whole law in two commands. Um, because it's only the, you know, the Godhead that can make commandments that are binding, and he can sum them all up in two. That shows his, his authority, but it also shows how simple it is. Love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that is incredibly simple, but incredibly complex. And I think those are the hallmarks of, I guess, maybe the teaching style of Jesus, that they are inherently simple, so simple that, you know, a, a an uneducated person in the first century could easily understand it. But then the most wise scholar could take a whole lifetime studying one verse and never get the fullness of it. Yeah. I always think about how I incorporate that in my life sometimes. You know, I, I, I love people like I, 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 you know, love my neighbor as myself. Right. So I, I would love people how I would want to be loved. And it's kind of funny sometimes when you love them, how you would want to be loved. And they're just like, no, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like that guy last night, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. with the, in the wheelchair, I was wheeling him around. Mm hmm. And I'm like, hey man, let's take you. We're gonna take you to go see Jesus, man. You want to go see Jesus? Mm -hmm. that, was, <laughs> that, like, was no. <laughs> well, that was beautiful you, last you, night. Well, he was beautiful. He was a little bit unsettled when you started popping wheelies in his wheelchair. <laughs> Again, I loved him how I wanted to be loved. <laughs> I would have liked somebody to pop a wheelie, get it going. I don't think he was in the place for that. Well, <laughs> this is my point. My point is, you love people as yourself. Mm -hmm. And, in, in, you know, in a good, fruitful way, not in a bad way. And, See, but, uh, you know, Jesus was work. doing this to confound the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and these scholars of the law. But then he takes it and then he takes it to the next level and he says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Oh, OK. You know, so that's so, kind uh, of where we got to we got to take it to the next level. <laughs> context. So, yeah, that, that's right. kind of a, a a further summation of this or a further restating of it. And that's in John's gospel. Um, but you know, he's giving you a new commandment, you know, and who else can give a commandment besides God on Sinai, right? If, if I were to, you know, journal through my, my, you know, my life and each year kind of pick out something that, that stands out the most, you know, I'm, I'm nearing uh, my 40th birthday and looking like it too. I am feeling it. I'm feeling <laughs> like it. I'm feeling like I'm 60. Um, the body, the body. <laughs> so this year for me, the thing that stands out the most is the new commandment. I have never really spent a lot of time thinking that before Jesus mounted the cross for our salvation, he gave us a new commandment. Mm -hmm. And I've always looked at the Ten Commandments. But when you start to introspectively look at your own limitations of love and you measure yourself to the cross of Jesus Christ, you you clearly recognize your weaknesses mm -hmm. and and you yeah. fall to your knees uh, you know at the name of Jesus and and his example of crucified love and it gives you strength to be able to endure greater sufferings for his name and to to pursue loving as he loves yeah now speaking about of almost turning 40 and me and Della Cross already having crossed that uh, barrier um, this next quote comes from the gospel of Mark. So this is Mark two seventeen, And Jesus heard this and said to them, those are who well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I do not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. Amen. What a, um, what a difference this would have sounded to, to the ears of the people hearing it, 
than any other religion and any other philosophy and any other itinerant uh, uh, teacher mm -hmm. and any other uh, wise person. How different this would have sounded because the old world was, you know, very elite and you had to be either have this Gnostic knowledge or be of great power or be of someone of importance. And he's like, no, the, the sit, you know, the, the healthy don't need a physician, the sick do, and I'm coming for them. That was a revolutionary statement, you know, mm -hmm. but then it's just also beautiful that <clears throat> it puts into context that why we need him and who he came to save. Mm -hmm. Right. Why we go to church. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you get to church, what's the first thing you do? You, you, after you make the sign of the cross and you're, you're, you're asking for God's mercy, you're recognizing your sin. I mean, the whole reason why we go to mass is to brethren, let us call to mind our sins so that we may be prepared to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I so mean, true. If you, if you can't see your own sin and offer that to God, that and it's, it's kind of like the, uh, what is it, the horse and the cart? The horse and the cart, yeah, you yeah. put in the cart before the horse. And yeah. the penitential act is the most necessary uh, preparation yeah. for the celebration of the liturgy of the Word and mm -hmm. the liturgy of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, realizing that we are sinful before a righteous God is amazing. And when we lose touch with that, and we become just a sterilized community and we become self-righteous. Christian communities and Catholic communities around the world, we can get into these uh, little pockets of self-righteousness. Absolutely. And, and it also, turns people away. And also apathy, right? Like spiritual apathy. It's like, you know, I'm a good person. You know, <coughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't do anything bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, no, it's not about being good and getting a star for your life, it's about recognizing your sinfulness, the grace of recognizing your sinfulness. And you know what this reminds me of is your confession where you like, you worked with this guy in your neighborhood and you're like, oh man, it's, you got to go to confession, bro. It's like, it's great. And you know, you're working with him, you bring him there. He's like, I'll, I'll go and I'll go into confession first. So you go into confession first. And he's like, I'll be, I'll be right back. And you're in there forever. And like the priest was like all over your face. <laughs> I was telling him how I can't, couldn't stand how... <laughs> People were in the confessional for a long time, you know, and he goes in after like, I don't know, 10 years or something and comes out in like a minute and I go in there and then the guy's like telling me I'm bad. I'm like, <laughs> you're arguing with him like, no, but I'm good, man. I, I didn't even finish my confession because the guy wouldn't stop, man. You got the Bozak, weird. dude. Yeah. Um, I, I do love that. that look, I love that story. God himself loves you so much that he comes for you in your weakness, mm -hmm. not in your greatness. Zeus would come for the great people. Uh, Poseidon right. would come for the great warriors and he would help Odysseus, right? Um, Mithras would come for the great priests and the kings. But the true God, the one and only true God came for the most weak, simple, and broken people. That is the... That is the dynamic core of Christianity that we forget so often. We do. How powerful the gospel in its simplicity yes. really is. Yes. And we can become beautiful churches and beautiful vestments, and we can have amazing priests like Mike Schmitz, and we can have all kinds of accoutrement. But when we forget that simplicity of the gospel, that God himself loves each person so much more than anything else, that he would create the whole universe and set atoms in motion to create billions of galaxies just for you, that is, that changes everything, you know? And yeah. we, can, we, it's, we can easily forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he wants your sinfulness so bad that he died to, right. to save you from them. No other yeah. gods in the mythologies or the other religions did that. And that shows me that this is the one true faith because God necessarily must be love. You know, if God is the perfection of all things and carries in him perfection of all things. He has to carry within him the perfection of love. And if God would not act in this way of loving, he is not a God, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is almost like the argument for the existence of God via the route of love, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and the ache of the human heart. Mm -hmm. We are and, created and for yeah, it. Yeah, C.S. Lewis gets into a lot of that. Yeah. And, you, you know, the, the fact that God creates this longing within, this thirst, this hunger, this, this ache for love, 
that will never fulfill, you know, in a fulfilled manner be manifested on this earth and that we must die, you know, that whole premise and the fact that Jesus Christ, son of God is crucified, you know, like, and, and this is what he, he left us his word that is the most <clears throat> circulated reality ever in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has access to this now, mm -hmm. you know, that we have this, like, I, I agree. It's like, how could you not see that this is a true faith? But I lived for a number of years of my life where I just right. didn't even uh, know. You yeah, know. the people on the outside yeah. of the church looking in, uh, it's it's the same It's the same miscalculation as, as all these other religions we're talking about. They look inside and they go, oh, I don't want to go in there because I'm... I'm not as good as you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you're so good, but you're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're so hypocrites. good, but you're not. You're hypocrites. And mm -hmm. it's like, uh, yeah, I am a hypocrite, but that's why I love my Lord. Mm -hmm. It's because he sees through that and he loves me through yeah. all that. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, speaking of truth, that, that takes us perfectly into the next quote on our list. And this is coming from the Gospel of John. So this is John 8. 31 and 32. And this speaks to, and I think this is beautiful because this is a saying that so many people will mention now in passing, but to see the inception of it in, in the proper context speaks to what we've been talking about up until this point. So, so Father? 8, 31 through 32. Jesus then said to those Jews who believed in him, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. You know, this world promises all sorts of freedoms to us, promises us the freedom of from any consequence and the freedom to be whoever we want and to make our own life and the freedom to change our identities and, and you know, any kind of freedom that you can imagine, be whatever you want to be. And they market happiness yeah. at the end of it. But that's not freedom because that's not the truth. The truth is Christ's words. And that truth is the only thing that will ever set you free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this probably on a on an impact level socially, this has to have probably more traction. If we were to kind of label like which of Jesus's sh sayings has entered into the culture mm -hmm. and entered into social dynamics in the world, I think this has entered into the world in a very, very powerful way mm -hmm. and used in all different types of circles. Which kind of um, dilutes it a little mm -hmm. bit. Be like, oh, well, you know, Alan Iverson, man, you know, he's the truth, man. Mm -hmm. Or no, it was Paul Pierce. No, that was the was truth. Pierce, yeah. yeah, well, and the truth will set you free. And it just becomes kind of Don't this. Don't mess with Alan Iverson. He's the answer. He's the answer. Quid es veritas, right? So, I, you know, but I some of these things do, they kind of go into, they become kind of just common sayings. But mm -hmm. Christ's word and him as the Logos incarnate, that is the truth. You will know the truth if you remain in my word, mm -hmm. you know, remain. And it's remaining in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's our freedom. He is the truth. Yeah, it's great. You brought up the uh, the truth and then the answer, the questions, all these things that are were offered in the world, um, much to our, our spiritual detriment because we, we latch on to things that aren't fully true. You mm -hmm. know, we latch on to a truth of how this person's harming that. And, and and then we've got people polarizing us in the different categories of human beings. There's no accord. Um, you know, you have distractions Good galore word. that have never been, um, I've never, never seen on this level. The, the, uh, distractions have been weaponized. They have been weaponized, <laughs> yeah. right? These are military grade distractions. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, that's <laughs> Actually, very true. You know, that's why, that's why I love, uh, Exodus 90 because it's a very simple program for men to disengage from a lot of this stuff and, and really like settle into this truth, mm -hmm. this truth of, who God is and who we are and who our brothers are. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, I, um, really recommend that to somebody who's looking for, you know, a, a guy who's looking for fraternity and for the ability to experience this freedom, yeah. this, uh, this freedom that's in the truth, the, the absolute truth, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that they really focus on with Exodus 90 is freedom. That's one of their their their, their core principles of what they're trying to achieve for men. Right. And they say, you know, with Exodus 90, with Exodus, you can try to, f you can find a freedom you've never found before. And you find that freedom through some of their practices of asceticism, of prayer, of fraternity, right? 
um, that same kind of freedom, you know, Exodus comes from the wisdom of the desert fathers, you mm-hmm. know, it started in the seminary right. through that desert t- father's teachings, but it's a w- they've adapted it to the modern life and to the challenges of the modern life. So they do all kinds of great things like helping you have a structure to break addictions to cell phones, break addictions to food, to frivolous spending, to uh, entertainment that's distracting you, um, to things that are pulling away from you, from God and your family and from being the man you want to be, right? Uh, you know, men say that, you know, they are finding true freedom through this program. So if you're interested in this program, go to exodus90.com forward slash the Catholic talk show, and you can try the app out for free. Right. Thousands and tens of thousands of guys have done this program and reported finding great new freedoms in their life and freedom in Christ because Christ's word is the truth and the truth sets you free. And Exodus 90 comes from the sense even of the Old Testament as well. And Moses leading the children of Israel out of slavery in in Egypt. And that was part of when, when I did the Exodus myself with my group, you know, that was something that stuck with me the whole time. And there was just so many illustrations of that and, and different reflections that they provide you that really leads you to an amazing place of prayer. Mm-hmm. And then the disciplines, putting it into action and having the reinforcement of other people that are accountable mm-hmm. to you, it, it really does produce a very positive effect. So we want to recommend you know, our partner, Exodus 90, uh, for any man out there uh, right now that just needs to take a step mm-hmm. and, and take a step into that freedom. This is a perfect scripture for Exodus 90. Uh, So let's move on to this next verse. And this one, again, you know, you know how much I love history, guys, right? And I read so much about ancient history. You know, I really try to understand the cultures. I try to understand the movements, the trends and forces of history, especially how they interacted with Christianity and led up uh, to to it, right? Uh, And this one takes so much of what had structured the ancient world and had oriented the ancient world in what was perceived as a good thing and completely upends it. So this is coming from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, 38 to 39. Who wants to take this one? I'll definitely take this one. All right. <clears throat> you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to the one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn to the other one, to him as well. Mm. You know, another another saying that has permeated the other cheek. Yeah, yeah, permeated all different types of social circles. Yeah, you know, turn the other cheek. You know, at the dawn of civilization, you know, one of the first codes of law that 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 even anyone knows about is the Code of Hammurabi, and the Code of Hammurabi was about justice. If someone breaks your tooth, you get to take their tooth. If someone pokes out your eye, you can poke out their eye. And that was their perception of justice. And it seems pretty just. It's like this is an equal recompense. You know, if someone steals something from you, you get the exact same thing back. Texas justice. Yeah. Texas justice. And it's trying to create a balance in in a scale. Well, here, you know, an eyeball weighs this, so you get an eyeball's worth of retribution back. But retribution is not justice. Retribution does not make anybody whole. Retribution does not give sight to a missing eye. Retribution does not put a tooth back in your mouth, right? Retribution is for the Lord alone, for the one who has the right to demand justice. As the Psalms say, God is the one who executes justice. That's right. But then for this preacher to come along in the backwoods of Galilee and say, Basically, the whole premise of the all of the laws of the world that everyone thought was good and say, no, if someone hits you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Give them the other one as well. I think, again, that shows the divine wisdom and divine love in a way that even in their best intentions, no human lawmaker mm. could ever perceive. Very good. I mean, Very it's, good. I mean, just think of the power that Christ had in, in the Father— you know, and and the justice that he could have executed on the world, mm-hmm. you know, and how many times the and the justice disciples... he will execute on the world, right? No, 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 you no, know? no, no, no. I mean, at the time that he was, you know, walking the he, earth, like he has the capacity to do right. it, right? And the and the and the, um, 
in the fullness of time, yeah. obviously there's the, there's that justice being executed. But you know, you think of all the disciples and how they wanted him to take out, you know, all these ruling parties of Rome of the of the Jewish uh, faith and traditions, like all the the suffering that was going on. They were really excited. They thought he was going to execute you know execute this justice immediately while he was there. And he's and he's just he's sharing these types of teachings to people they must be they, there must have been a lot Confounded. of people disappointed i'm sure they were you disappointed know, a lot of people disappointed like yeah. okay well, you know i mean i don't have the i don't i don't really want it, this this freedom in the heart i want freedom from all this crap right you know and again it's talking about you know this world but this world is not what you're made for you know mm-hmm. the israelites were anticipating the messiah a warrior king yeah. but one of those anticipations like one of four actually um, was this warrior king that was going to overthrow right. worldly powers and establish a kingdom that would never be, you know, destroyed? Mm-hmm. And isn't it interesting that he has done that? Yeah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know. But it was done in a different manner. Yeah, I mean, just look at the, look at Christendom and look at how it has stood as a bulwark against the world through every generation and age ever since. Nations Uh, and governments have come and gone. I just legal codes have come and gone. And Solomon in all of his greatness and then the line of David, that can't be said for, you know, but his kingdom has stood. And that's by turning the other cheek. How counterintuitive to become the the king of kings. Mm -hmm. The only the true Lord, you know? Yeah. Christos Kyrios, right? Mm -hmm. Christ is Lord. By turning the other cheek, you look, Caesar would have your head cut off and crucify you. Uh, Hammurabi would knock out your eye and your tooth, right? <laughs> um, but Jesus, the warrior king, uses by turning the other cheek to achieve that victory. It's, it's confounding. And he, and he lives this all the way to the cross. And he does. That's the power of the gospel that we miss so often. And even, I think, you know, Catholics would expect, like, you know, you know, a warrior pope to go and smite all the people and create this great crusade. But, you know, St. Francis is probably closer to the perfect model of Christianity right. than Pope Julius II, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And tied, tied to this, you know, another saying of Jesus, which is definitely up there on the list, is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Absolutely. Right? All the way up to the point where you were just saying, Delacrosse, the fact that he continues to turn the other cheek and at this most definitive moment of rejection and bodily suffering, he opens himself so definitively in time where his heart pours out mercy from the cross. Father, forgive them. Yeah. And, you know, that that's one of the, the seven last words of Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. but that's the first one. And I think it really is... Uh, the second person of the Trinity being unjustly executed by the state as a criminal, tortured to death. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Ah, Man, I could just, I mean, look, in the other religions of the ancient world, if you looked at Zeus wrong, he'd turn you into a Mm -hmm. swan, you know? (laughs) You know, I mean, if you looked at Osiris wrong, they would kill you and chop you up and throw you in the Nile, right? Mm -hmm. You're actually, you're killing God made man and he's asking forgiveness for you. Again, the sayings of Jesus, they're so great because they're so confounding. They confound human wisdom because they're above human wisdom. I would say they confound human reason. Uh, I don't think, I don't think there's any wisdom in, in human. Well, wisdom's more transcendent. I know, right? I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, they confound hum, yeah. human, the limits of our reason and our wisdom, yeah. because we don't think like this, yeah. you know? And I do mm-hmm. think that just in the nature of his sayings, you can kind of discern a, a you know, a theological proof of the divinity of Christ. Mm-hmm. And I love how the progression of the sayings that we're exploring is leading us to these seven last sayings. Mm -hmm. And there is great devotion in the history and the tradition of the Catholic Church reflecting on these sayings. 
So as we go through these sayings together, I just want to encourage again to all of our viewers and, and listeners in the comments section, you know, you minister to one another and you minister to us as well. You know, what are these scripture verses for you? What does this make you think of? Right. And then are we missing, uh, you know, some of the sayings of Jesus that, that stand out to you that, that you're governed by? Mm -hmm. And as we go through these seven last sayings, you know, share with us what they, what they mean to you mm -hmm. and, and how you're touched by them. Um, this next this next verse, uh, Luke twenty three forty three. Uh, so the the first saying is, "Father, forgive them, uh, for they know not what they do." Uh, this the second one is, "Verily I say unto thee, today you shall be with me in paradise." <clears throat> so truly I say to you, today you will be with me. In paradise, and he's saying that to our guy, you know, our mm -hmm. one of our patrons, you know, Saint Dismas, right? And he's, and this is also after their discussion with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, like mm -hmm. he, he's forgiving you, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and he's still, like, in this moment that everyone, yeah. anyone in their right mind would say, "Wow, this guy kind of took the L today." Mm -hmm. They kind of proved that he was not anything. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, this is a catastrophic failure for any sort of wannabe king. Right. And he is on this cross, crucified, bleeding, dehydrated, dying. And he's saying to a criminal, you're going to be with me in paradise. And people are like, even to the end, this guy is just completely turning everything on its ear. <laughs> so he, he at first, <laughs> you know. It's crazy. It, it is. It's, it's amazing. It's confounding. <laughs> you know, and it, and it does. It moves you to, to fear, uh, and fear of the Lord uh, and his greatness, mm -hmm. and then wonder and awe. And that same seventh gift of the Spirit, you're just, you're blown away because we think as human beings do. Yeah. Like Jesus said to Peter, you know, like you're not thinking as God does. That's another great, another great thing. <laughs> there's so many, like the Beatitudes. There's a, mm -hmm. there's so many. We can't, we can't cover them all. But these seven last words are so profound, and you're going to see as this conversation shifts deeper and deeper into these last words and what's going to be stimulated in your heart. But the fact that he moves from extension of mercy to all of humanity, Father, forgive them, to now precisely acting in mercy toward an individual sinner in the consequence of the closest his one actions. Can find. Yeah. I mean, that's like solidarity. <laughs> like, man, look, that is the nearest person to him and he's ministering to him it, it, at the point of the death of a sinner. Like, right. Right there. That's so powerful. That that is consequential to his actions that have been clearly in want. Yeah. You know, his actions have failed. And this is the consequence he's facing. Jesus is willing to go to that point. For Dismas. Man. Right? Dismas, you know. What an example. The first saint. The first canonized I saint. Love I love it. I love We love Dismas so yeah. much. And I love saying that too. Biblically speaking, who is the first canonized saint? Saint Dismas. <laughs> Pray um, for us. All right. So the, the next of the last words. So, you know, we, we gave all these sayings, but we're kind of lumping all of the last saying, the last seven words of Jesus into this, and we're going to go through these. So this is coming from the Gospel of St. John, chapter mm -hmm. 19. Woman, behold thy son, and behold thy mother. Now, this is to my guy, St. John, and I love St. John. And this, I think this is a, this is uh, Mariology. This is showing Mary's... Um, Supernatural motherhood of all humanity. Um, it, this is this this shows the I think also shows the perpetual virginity of Mary as a as a scriptural proof, um, and it also shows because how clearly she wouldn't have been entrusted to John in any other. Yeah, like hey, you know all those brothers and sisters, all the Protestants say you have, uh, you know my own mother from the cross. Yeah, don't go to them. Go to this dude. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. I, I, it just doesn't. But it shows that Jesus entrusted us to the heart of Mary, but Amen. then also entrusts Mary to the church, to mm -hmm. St. John, um, so that she is, even from the cross, a, a, a gift to humanity, you know, our fallen nature's sole boast, right? Uh, it's, so, it's so beautiful that, you know, again, we're getting very high-minded, you know, and especially in the Gospel of John, that's very theological, but even then, yeah. he's... Still a man, mm -hmm. and he still loves his mother, and he's still, even in accomplishing a theological 
uh, coup de grace in presenting Our Lady as, you know, the queen of heaven and the mother of the church, he's still taking care of his mother's needs. He's still making sure that she's going to have a, you know, a nice warm meal in the morning and a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. So again, there's these deep dual meanings. There's practicality, there's divinity, there's our role, there's the particular role of the people in the time of the place, and then there's a greater meaning for the history of the church in one little sentence, Mm -hmm. you know? And and to receive the maternal care as Mary becomes mother of the church, Mm -hmm. you know, like mother of each of us as, as disciples of Jesus, you know, we receive the maternal care of our lady and Jesus is the one who instituted it. Mm -hmm. So we see more clearly who Jesus is. And then at the same time, who Mary is. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think even too then the um, the word that he used, the Hebrew word that he used for mother, was the same word that was used in Genesis, which was a unique way of saying um, woman, mm-hmm. where uh, where the God says, "I will put enmity between you and the woman." Mm-hmm. Right? He used that that same word, right? When when he was at that, so I, I think you know when you start when you start putting all this together, you can even break down even crazy. You can further. break this down into a lot of mm-hmm. compartments of like. Jesus knew what he was saying. You know, and this mm-hmm. goes back to what I was saying earlier. The most simple countryside farmer from first century Judea would hear this stuff and say, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And you take the, you take Thomas Aquinas, you could have had his whole life trying to unpack one of these statements, and he couldn't have accomplished it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have 2,000 years of concentrated prayer mm-hmm. and academic treatment over these words, yeah, and that's why it's so important to hear from you out there mm-hmm. as well, because you have been studied, you studied, you've looked at the saints, you've looked at the mystics, you've prayed with these last words, you've gone to Good Friday liturgies, and mm-hmm. and you've participated in the, you know, we need to share these mysteries with one another. So this begins the conversation. You continue the conversation. So mm-hmm. again, put the put those comments in the in the comment box. All right. So let's let's go through the the last four here. Uh, this one is from Matthew 27. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm-hmm. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And this is something we were talking about before. It's just, uh, you know, in conversation, the fact that Jesus enters into this forsaken relationship mm-hmm. with the Father, but still in the state of this sorrow, in the state of suffering, he continues that election that is most permanent in his life, the election to manifest the perfection of love and the perfection mm. of humanity. He he fulfills all of the law. He fulfills all of the prophecy that leads up to this definitive act. And of course, it makes complete sense that he would experience this dryness in spirit mm-hmm. and, and that he would feel forsaken, that his emotional state in his humanity is not jiving with what he's actually accomplishing mm-hmm. in the action of crucifixion. Yeah, and, and but it's also showing that he's praying because mm-hmm. this is one of the Psalms. This is one of the Psalms mm-hmm. of Lamentations. Mm-hmm. So as someone who is intimately, well, you know, inspired the scriptures, Mm -hmm. but who intimately in his human wisdom knew the scriptures as, you know, as the greatest teacher, he would have, that would have been like, you know, you or I, you know, in the hospital, you know, asking for a viaticum or saying the Hail Mary because we know we're about to die. Mm -hmm. This would have been an appropriate thing for a Jew of the time to do this prayer of lamentation that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This would have been a very, uh, people would have understood it, but again, you know, did they understand that he was taking on all the sins of all humanity at the moment? Or did they just say, look, he's praying, right? Mm-hmm. Again, the 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 deep and, and curly meaning behind mm-hmm. all this is just it, it's they're, they're multifaceted. Yeah. And you know, anybody I've I've been asked this question before, like people sit there and they'll say, I don't understand how you do what you do. You know, and Delacross even shared this morning, like, you know, we had some moments of interaction, pastoral care. And, you know, we're walking away from the church and, and Della Cross just takes a, <sighs> oh, dude. Okay. And, you know, and, and Delhi was in the, in the seminary for a while. And, you know, what you were sharing before was really supportive to, to me. I, I believe you have a charism to support priests. Um, but in the sense of what, beyond just like empathic support, 
what the Psalms do in the life of, of priests praying the liturgy of the hours, you know, when it comes to like, how do I continue this, this journey? Well, it's because in my heart and in my soul and in my life and in my suffering, I'm having contact, contact with fulfilling Psalms and Christ is giving me this, you know, mm-hmm. invitation to live the mysteries that he lived and to mm-hmm. participate in, in the priesthood that's been offered to me that's exercised most perfectly in him. It's like those contact with the Psalms of David, you know, and, and, and what Jesus lived and breathed, you know, this is all prophetically leading up to Jesus fulfilling it all. Right. And we get to experience that firsthand in our own sufferings and our own fulfillment of our vocations before God. That's why praying the Psalms for all of us, you know, the liturgy, the hours and 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 being prayerful is so ultimately important. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm very proud that the show that we've partnered with Hallow mm-hmm. and and we have an established relationship with these guys because they're they're setting the tone of prayer. That's right. And and they provide five thousand over five thousand resources uh, through their app mm-hmm. to help you grow in your prayerful relationship with Christ. That's right. I mean, they have put together an an absolute compendium of Catholic prayer. You know, from rosaries, examines, daily reflections. Um, you know, from sleep aids to. Uh, you know, kids' stories to just Jonathan Rumi Rumi reading the Bible, chaplets, and, Bishop Barron mm-hmm. and Mike Schmitz, and they have, you know, Matt Frad's lo fi music. They have chant. This app really has just about everything. And whatever you're looking to meditate on, however you're looking to improve your prayer life, this app is a fantastic resource mm-hmm. for that. And it's continuing to expand and grow month to month. Absolutely. You know, they, they continue to add content on there, and it's impressive mm-hmm. what they've set into motion. So if you go to hollow.com forward slash the Catholic Talk Show, you can download the app for free. Um, you can get the, the the standard version of it, and they have some advanced features, which cost you less than a cup of coffee a month, right? Um, you know, if a cup of coffee keeps you awake for maybe two hours and prayer can keep your soul alive forever, I mean, where's the value in that? <laughs> it's not that much, but, you know, it takes money to put together 5,000, uh, you know, prayers and get all these things and coordinate it. Uh, you know, this is not like this big, you know, uh, money-making scheme. This is, again, supporting a movement in the church of prayer using technology to generate And this is precisely what lives. we need to do. Yeah, I mean, this, this is with, good stewardship. With the advancement yeah. of technology that it advances 200% each year, and, and it's a growing power in society, and it can be wielded to very evil ends, the church needs to make its primary objective to move onto the digital continent with the utmost energy and resources to establish as many movements within Catholic culture online today. Mm-hmm. And between our partnerships with Exodus 90 and Hallow, who are doing it sublimely well, you know, we need more people out there to get behind these movements because, mm-hmm. you know, that's where the church needs to be and that's where we're going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, on the last three of the sayings, I'm going to lump them together because I think they really show the culmination of the crucifixion. Mm-hmm. Let's have Deli read this one. Yeah. So yeah. Th- these are the last three sayings. So read these three here. <clears throat> I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the things that stand out for me is uh, his humanity, you know, and our humanity that sense of I thirst, mm. you know, and then Mother Teresa's reflections on I thirst and the poverty of our humanity and, mm-hmm. and how that's presented in the world. And the fact that living and, and trusting in Christ and, and turning to him, um, you know, one of, the, one of my favorite sayings of Jesus is, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Uh, the reality that our thirst and our ache and that that interior struggle that each of us have is ultimately going to come to a completion. And, and when it is finished in us, when we trust in God and trust in Christ and not allow those daily anxieties and not allow those uh, troubles of the past or troubles of the future consume us, my brothers and sisters, Jesus will bring to a fruitful completion in that it is finished in you as well. 
and and to show that humanity coming from the the to I thirst to it is finished is a is a beautiful way to to see that. Absolutely. And you know, uh, man, if he had a time machine, wouldn't you go back and just do anything you could to give him a glass of water? Mm. Just anything, you know? Mm. Uh, boy, it's just it's so unjust the suffering that he suffered, but you're right, it shows that 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 humanity. And it is finished. Again, it's finished. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up the, you know, I, it, the, my death has been consummated. But also the act of atonement for the sins of mankind has been finished. And his ministry, um, you know, it is finished to that point. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, again, just so, it is finished. Three words and none of us in a lifetime's worth of work could ever fully and summate that three word statement. Yeah, his passion is finished. I mean the the just the the way of the cross and you know you start at Gethsemane and you know you go all the way through his torture, his capture, his betrayal, um his and the passion that he had to to take up his cross and finish this this act, right? This 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 very brief time in in human history um you know and, and finishing that mm-hmm. uh that's quite an accomplishment three years of public ministry <laughs> yeah. to, do, mm-hmm. to say all of that to do all of that mm-hmm. uh, is is mind-blowing to me and then finally you know father into your hands i commend my spirit and to what you're saying before with father why have you forsaken me in that reference to the psalm but you know, Jesus is still making that offering, that canonic offering back to the Father, and he and he gives himself entirely, abandoning all that he had done. Giving himself in the role of the mm-hmm. high priest, offering himself mm-hmm. as an offering. It's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. It's beautiful. The depth to it is just so, so profound. And we just are just so grateful for the profound relationship that we have with all of our followers and, and people that we connect with online. We want to give a shout out to our patrons and the people who support the show. We look forward to future hangouts with you, and, and we've got some great places coming up very soon. Mm-hmm. If you're considering being a patron and supporting the show financially, check us out, catholictalkshow.com slash Patreon, and we've got some cool gear to send your way. To each and every one of you, let's continue to focus on Jesus' word and live by it. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.